Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com, and I'm joined by Kishore Hari, who is the director of the Bay Area Science Festival, and also our newest science correspondent. Senior science correspondent? Senior science correspondent. Excellent. Now, Kishore, you're about to chat with some researchers from the EPFL. We are here at Swissnex, which is one of uh, a facility in San Francisco that brings Swiss researchers to San Francisco and Silicon Valley to interface with a lot of different folks. And a group from EPFL, one of the largest science institutes in all of Switzerland, is here with their biorobotics group. They're showing off a number of different biomimicry robots, and we're going to get to meet Pluribot. Let's go check out Pluribot. We're here with Alka Ice Spirit, and we have a, a new friend to show off, Pluribot. Pluribot is a, a salamander creation? Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about why a salamander. Yeah, so we're interested in, in salamander because it's a very old animal. So it's a very interesting animal um, to study the evolution from swimming to walking. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a living fossil almost of the first tetrapod, the first animal walking on ground. So salamanders can transition in the water and into land. Absolutely. And it has a very interesting sort of spinal complexity to it that actually looks very similar to some fish in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. And how have you sort of constructed this? It seems like each vertebrae has individual controls in it. Yeah, that, I think that's an interesting part of the, the robot. It has been designed to be very close to X-ray videos that we have taken of the real animal. Mm -hmm. So um, we took videos of the animal walking, swimming, doing aquatic stepping, all mm -hmm. type of gates. And then we extracted the data and we made a robot that could replicate as well as possible all, all set of gates. Mm -hmm. So it can swim, it can walk, it can almost one-to-one -one replay exactly this, this data from the real animal. How complicated is the gate of a salamander uh, overall? Does it have just one simple gate when it walks on land? No, it's, it's very rich. So um, it's a bit, it's not like a lizard. So it's not, it's a bit slower than a lizard, but it can walk like a lizard. And in the water, it swims like an eel or a lamprey. So it swims back and forth like in that S pattern. Absolutely, yeah. So it's quite rich. And, and so it can do all kinds of motor behaviors. And that was why we wanted to, to have the robot to be as close as a real animal. So we have like 27 motors, which is a lot for a robot. And we can really replay all kind of motor behaviors that the animal does. Is this robot actually as complex as the real animal in terms of its degrees of, of motion? No, it's still simpler, of course. Like the, you see here, we have like eight, nine motors for the spine. The real animal has 40 vertebrae. So there we have to simplify a bit due well, to constraint of technology. Let's get a little bit closer and actually yeah. check out some of the construction. So it seems like these vertebrae are, are 3D printed, it looks like. Absolutely, yeah. All, all pieces are 3D printed and we use high-end Dynamixels motors, so several motors for, for the degrees of freedom. And we have a computer here on board uh, to run the whole um, control. And what kind of sensors are in the, in the creature? So we have mainly position sensors, so we, the, the robot, the animal knows exactly its, its postures. Uh, we can have, it's not here, but we often have 3D force sensors at the mm -hmm. end so that you know exactly the pressure. And, so and it can cover rougher terrain. Exactly. With those 3D and it can sensors. know if it's in contact with the ground, if it's slipping or not. And we have on board a camera to, um, to, to, to just have a camera to do obstacle avoidance. Is it a simple camera or is it a video feed that you can actually get out of it? Yeah, so it's you a can video see. feed. Uh, absolutely, it's a video feed. I, we could show you, in fact, a video feed that, that uh, the robot sees. Well, yeah. we're going to take a walk with him in a little bit. Uh, why the name Pluribot? What does Pluribot yeah, mean? Pl so Pluribot comes simply because we, we modeled it very closely to the salamander called Pluridel Swelt. Mm -hmm. So that's why Pluido, ro Pluribot. Yeah. And is there a reason you chose this many vertebrae specifically? Is this, uh, is this a, this is, seems a lot bigger than a normal salamander. That's true. Mm -hmm. Although there's the Japanese salamander, which is huge. There's a uh, Japanese yeah, yeah, yeah. salamander this big? This big, absolutely. Oh, that's it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's a constraint of mix, merging like relating technology to the real data. So we, we wanted to closely match the data, mm -hmm. the, the swimming data. And, and for that, we, we have the constraint of motors, which are not, they become very bad if you have the small volume. So you, we, we started with a motor and then did an optimization process to match as well as possible mm -hmm. the, the real data, the, the real animal data. And so this seems to have a couple degrees of freedom when it comes to the, the legs itself. It can stand up and sort of let yep. itself down. Yeah, four degrees of freedom per, for each leg. And yep. then the vertebrate themselves, how many degrees of freedom do they have? They are, they stand for the whole spine. So in total, the robot has 27 degrees of freedom. 
And uh, how quickly does this move? How, like, what does it sort of look yeah. like and feel like when you, it's you, I think the best is to make a demo. You'll see it's, it's fairly slow, exactly like the real salamander. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we can also swim, so if we put a suit, we can swim. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit slower than the real it animal. It has to get in a swimsuit to swim? Yeah, exactly. We have a dry suit uh, to make oh, it Oh, to protect uh, all the electronics? Absolutely. yeah. And then tell us a little bit about what's going on in the head. What, is that where a lot of the, the brain exactly. is for the entire robot? So the, this robot is used for exploring indeed how the animal moves. So we like to make models of the spinal cord, the real animal spinal cord, so the neural circuits. And we, we basically model them on board of the robot. And that will then coordinate all the motion uh, of the whole articulation for the, the spine and of the, of the limbs for the different modes of locomotion. So let's take it for a spin. We have a couple pilots here. Yeah, this is Tomislav and Robin. They do their PhD thesis on this robot. And Tomislav will send high level signals to control the motion. And then it's really the control on board of the robot that will coordinate all the 27 degrees of, of motion. And basically, you've just adapted a, a standard off-the-shelf controller, just a PS3 controller, it looks like, yes, to absolutely. control this. Yeah. And that has enough degrees of freedom to control this motion, because yes. you're basically just using the stump thumbstick and it looks like the buttons. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. He, he, and he will at some point modulate it, so he has different modes where he can like posture, do mm -hmm. different type of postures. So what we're seeing now, where it's sort of rising up and and sort of looking around, is that common among salamanders? Yeah. I've never seen a salamander yeah, do no, that. Here, here, this is like a uh, an artificial control. This is mm -hmm. not the spinal cord model that we're running here. This is just inverse kinematics. In fact, mm -hmm. just uh, moving, pointing the head in different directions, and then. The, the control on board solves the problem of how to coordinate all the degrees of freedom so that the, the head is oriented in different directions. So we see it sort of walking around and it, it has this sort of lumbering gait to it. And is, is that pretty consistent to how a salamander moves? Absolutely. Uh, uh, when, when I can show you movies of the X-rays data and you can see it's almost one to one the same. Mm -hmm. The animal is also quite slow, mm -hmm. and uh, it uses this, this, it's called a walking trot gait, mm -hmm. where you have this coordination of the a standing wave of body undulation with movement of the limbs. So what happens when we take it into the water? What happens to the limbs? Are they part of the swimming process at all? Interestingly, sometimes. So the animal can paddle. So for slow... A paddle just like a normal human would paddle. Yes, but typically an animal, when you... The salamander, if you place it in water, it will use this anguilliform swimming gait. Mm -hmm where the limbs are completely folded against the body, not used anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the whole spine that makes the, the lateral undulation for, for swimming. So does it use that undulation motion at all when it's on land? Yes, absolutely. But it uses another mode of undulation. It uses a body undulation, which is a standing wave. And interestingly, that's important because the, uh, it's a bit technical, but the, the anchor points of the standing wave becomes like where the limbs are attached. And there's a very nice coordination with the body undulation to optimize uh, the step lengths, basically. What do we see something like this used for? Like, what are you hoping to understand beyond the locomotion of a salamander? Yes, so, so we have a spin-off project where we have a, a slightly modified version of this robot for search and rescue. Mm -hmm. So the dream would be to have an amphibious robot that can crawl, swim, and walk. And it can go through some pretty sm tight spaces? Exactly. Especially shallow water is hard for rescuers because you, you are close to the ground, you have contact in the ground, so anything which needs a rope that kind of slides through can be very interesting. And then the idea is to have like a thermal camera on board, normal cameras, microphone, loudspeakers, to see basically if they're survivors. Uh, and does it already have GPS on board and IMUs and all of the basic not, sensors? That not we this one, but the, the one we're building will have it, absolutely. Has it actually been used in different first responder situations already, or is that still in development? We, we're discussing with stakeholders in, in search and rescue, so they, they're giving us feedback. Exactly like they were telling us that shallow water was important for them. Pipes, small holes. Oh, pipes where humans can't fit up. Absolutely. So they, they're guiding us a bit to what, what would be a niche, a, a need of, for such a robot. What's the next generation of Chlorobot going to look like? It will be slightly a bit simpler because like here we, we have 27 motors, that's really a lot. It was very important for neuroscience to be able to do all this richness of motor behaviors. But for search and rescue it will be a bit simpler. A bit closer to the, to, for instance, eel-like robot with maybe rotational limbs. Or, so we will maybe simplify a bit the body structure. It can swim, it can walk, it's Floribot. It was delightfully adorable, this bot. And when it like kind of 
cinched up on its legs and looked around. It was almost mammalian in terms of what they could do with just these simple movements. Yeah, biomimicry robots, uh, you always wonder how far do they want to go with the mimicry. Uh, if they're studying just the locomotion, how different animals in the real world get around, there's a lot of applications for robotics. But they went an extra step, made it look like a salamander, almost gave it a personality of a real character. I'm really curious to see what the live video feed from it looks like because you're going to have that right out that nose look as it's crawling through places that you know nothing normally created could go like going into those pipes. Uh, I'm really interested as a first responder and I love that what we got to see was so much more complicated than what the first responders actually need. We saw like almost 30 different motors through the spine, uh, the degrees of freedom in each of the, the limbs, and the transition from water to land, that seems exceptional to me. The fact that it has a swimsuit, not so bad either. Yeah, yeah, it's a salamander oh. robot with a wetsuit, essentially. Tailored wetsuit, too. Tailored wetsuit. Now, these robots, you know, they're, they're still in the process of development right now, but we gotta imagine five years from now, 10 years from now. It may not look exactly like that. Five and years from now is the term that scientists use when they don't know actually when it's gonna, <laughs> exactly. it's gonna happen. But what's interesting to me is you've seen growth in this field. Everything from like seeing geckos like it here and have that be a new form of how we're gonna climb up walls and have just learn more about adherence. Like understanding the gates of this robot is really about efficiency. That we think that salamander transitioning water land can do things that our normal robotic structures right now can't in a more efficient way. And we know batteries are a big limitation here. Yep. So that efficiency is gonna pay back in a big way down the road. Biomimicry. It's a really exciting field of robotics. We're glad to be able to share with you some research overseas from Switzerland, from the EPFL, and we'll have more visits to institutes to chat with scientists, roboticists, researchers with Kishore in the future. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.